for the second time in my life, I get to do something I've never done before, which is to introduce two people at the same time. Now, the reason I say it's the second time is because I did it at 9 o'clock service. And so I want to take this opportunity to do that now. Uh, I don't normally like to give a lot of facts and figures. And if you really want to know about these folks, you can go to Wikipedia or somewhere like that and get all those facts and figures, okay? Uh, Dr. Gandhi was uh, raised in South Africa. But what's really important is what he has learned throughout his life and how he shares that with people. He genuinely, and if you're around him, you know it, loves people. You know, I say, do you want to go sit down for a while and be quiet? No, it's okay. I can just mingle here. Uh, that's okay. And uh, he's gentle. Uh, and he is authentic. He brings to us not only what he believes, but what he is, which is a man of peace. As I've listened to him, I had the opportunity for this weekend to be with him a little bit. I have learned things about myself that I have to examine. I have learned things about nonviolence that I didn't quite understand at a deeper level. And so he has blessed my life, and I know he's going to bless yours this morning. And I thank him for being here. And also speaking is Bethany Hegedus. Bethany is, I'll, I'll let her describe what Vicki says she is. But anyway, uh, uh, she is dynamic. She has a story to tell. She, her life has been transformed, and she, understand what that, she understands what that means. She is part of the Unity organization in many ways. And Bethany shared last night her story of 9-11 and brought tears to our eyes. She also is genuine and authentic. She is a person who touches the lives of children throughout America by giving this message of peace, this, this message of the wisdom of Gandhi to those children. And so I now have her come forward, Bethany, and I have both of them stand as an introduction. And Arne, stand right up there and say hello. Okay, thank you. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here. Thank you. Um, as Reverend Bunch said, um, I talked last night about the genesis of Grandfather Gandhi beginning with 9-11. But I actually began before that. Um, I have been and practiced unity since I was a late teen and was raised Catholic and found um, my spirit inside of the Unity Church. And it was a Unity Church that asked Dr. Arun Gandhi to come to Manhattan to help us heal. So I'm very touched when I get to speak to Unity members, people who believe that we can act and we can make a difference. And because I had those principles, they were part of the ask that I'll share about today. So I want to say thank you for your belief, thank you for your actions, and thank you for having me. I was so touched this morning. I get a little weepy when I get moved. And I, again, was moved by Cece's talk and by Katrina's Gorgeous, gorgeous voice. My goodness. Such talent and beauty you have here in Richmond. Um, truly, truly amazing. And spirit speaks to us in many ways. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So who was at the event last evening? OK, quite a few of us. All right, so today what I'm going to talk about is spirit within. So Marianne Williamson, in Everyday Grace, Having Hope, Finding Forgiveness, and Making Miracles, writes, you have tremendous gifts to give. God sent them with you when you came to this earth. And while you might forget them or doubt they exist, God does not forget. He, she, will show them to you. As soon as your gifts are dedicated to his work, they will blossom. I believed those words before I lived them, but now that I have lived them, I feel a sense of urgency in helping others access their God-given gifts. 
Vicki said to me this morning as she was introducing me to Cece that I was passion in action. <laughs> and I loved that, and I think I'm going to adopt that from now on. I'm not sure my husband will like that. He gets, he gets a different side of my passionate in action -ness. But um, I, I really did love that because we need to be moved by what we care about and what we see as the way we can make a difference. So since many of you were there last night, I'm just going to share with you the closing of a poem I wrote about my 9-11 experience. To make sense of that day, I turned to writing, and I did that long before I was published. Um, I did that as a child. That's the way I made sense of the world, was through reading and experiencing books, and it opened my eyes to the world. And when I could write down what I felt and what I experienced, I was able to make sense, sense of things. And I really needed and struggled to make sense with that day. So this is from the end. Key sticks in the lock. I make my way to the mirror, touch my reflection, proving that I am still alive. Deep breath and tears come. My throat is ragged. I cannot breathe. I wrestle my linen blazer and wrap myself in flannel. My phone will not dial out. No one but Maureen knows I am alive. Maureen is the only survivor I know. Office mates disappeared, vanished with coffee and muffin. I see my mother's lips silently praying. I feel my father's bear hug. I sense the prayers said in my name, but the shock won't shed. So I watch with the nation as reality is repeated over and over and over. The planes, the towers, the fall. Having witnessed what I witnessed and having been there that day, I felt very personally that I needed to do something. But what? I was broken and I was afraid and I was just one person. As a prisoner of Unity of New York, I went to the talk that Arun gave that he was invited to give to help New York heal. And Arun spoke that night about total forgiveness. And I felt strangely, after that horrific day, a sense of peace. And I met someone this week who had been there, one of the mothers from the school that was taking photographs the other day. And she had been on the Upper West Side. And she commented to me about the spirit of New York in the days afterwards. There was this peace and this companionship and this ability to look one another in the eye and see what we needed. And it was a, a different feeling for New York. There are so many people there, you have to not look people in the eye to be able to get through your day. And we were present to one another. And it was such a gift in those days after. And we did need healing. And when Arun came, it like really transformed my life. And when I heard him, as I shared last night, I thought to myself, these stories should be a picture book. And so, see, I'm a writer for children, or in late 2001, I was an aspiring writer for children. I was a beginner, pre-published, I like to call it. We have any pre-published people with us today? <laughs> Wonderful. Um, and when those words came out of my mouth, these stories should be a picture book, they didn't feel like mine. They were spirits. But I dismissed it. Spirits spoke to others, not to me. But I had been moved. I heard a call that night when I heard Arun speak, a call that I felt in my bones since surviving that Tuesday morning. And Spirit's voice grew louder and louder, and slowly and doubtfully at first, I began to stoke the fires of that idea. Arun's stories should be a book for children. A match had been lit. What I could do to fight terrorism and to help bring healing into the world was to use my God-given talents. Spirit was urging me to listen. Spirit was urging me to act. What is spirit asking you? I mustered up all my courage. The cowardly lion had always been my favorite character in The Wizard of Oz. 
aside from Toto, who I was very worried would be forgotten. <laughs> and I now have a chihuahua myself who I'm forever turning around to look at to see where he is. And the cowardly lion would have been proud that I sent Dr. Gandhi, a stranger to me, a man who I heard speak just once, an email when I asked him to work with me. Ask, Math 7, Matthew 7.7 7 says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. And so I asked. I asked, and Arun said yes. Spirit asked me, and I said yes. What is spirit asking you? What are your unique talents that you can share with the world? As one of your congregation just stood up and shared, how can you be the change? Miracles happen when we are bold, when we believe. I often joke in the long 10-year span that it took to have this first book published, and the second book took two weeks for the publisher to say yes. I often joke that this book, that I believed this book into being. But underneath that joke, there's a real truth. I did believe. I honored Arun's belief in me, something I will never forget and always be honored by. I honored my belief in spirit. And over those 10 years of hearing no, of changing agents, of seeing my novels, my individual projects published before my work with Gandhi, I believed. During this time, I taped by rejection mantra a line from a Wallace Stevens poem to my computer. After the final no, there comes a yes. And on that yes, the future world depends. The future world is here. It has been here with me since the book came out since I've been fortunate enough to go into schools and share the book with kids, to talk with them about who Gandhi was and what his work is and how they can use their anger as Arun does as a force for change. You know, I get letters from young readers after visiting. Last night I shared the response from the autistic fifth grader and I was so touched when the audience erupted into spontaneous um, applause after his words. And so while his words were profound as a fifth grader from an autistic young man, I want to share some responses from kids from your area, kids I visited last Friday from McLean. I spoke to um, K through two in the morning, and then in the afternoon, these two young girls came in with these thank you letters for me uh, that I'm sure were a class assignment after my presentation. <laughs> And, um, but they were still so touching. And these are a couple of the responses. In library, we read Grandfather Gandhi. So I wanted to tell you some of my connections. Sometimes I just want to do something when I am angry. Sometimes I go to someone and talk it out. Then I feel better. Caroline. I like the book. Sometimes when my little sister gets mad at me, she bites me. And my mommy and daddy get mad at her. <laughs> but I'll tell her to stop. But even though every time I tell her to stop, she doesn't stop. But I will try. From Sophie. <laughs> I was mad and I almost threw a rock. But I stopped myself and then I exercised and then I felt better. <laughs> From Emily. I think we may have a future triathlete. And Emily. <laughs> I love the raw honesty of kids and their ability to make connections between what angers them and what they can do about it. And I'm eager to hear how our new book, Be the Change, encourages them to look deeply at passive violence, something we all need to do. Arun has spoken about the pencil story, about throwing away a nubby pencil because he felt he deserved a better pencil. And I love that he used that word, deserved. Um, as a Gandhi, he felt he deserved something, and his grandfather was always there to reassure him or to remind him that he was not special because of his last name, that we are all one. And he held him to that when he asked him to go find that pencil out in the field that took two hours. 
And that story, again, changed Arun, and it changed me. And hopefully, it will change the readers of the book and change you. So here's a little bit from our future book. Grandfather has set out to teach me the deeper meaning of the rule not to waste, just as monsoon season had come. The skies erupted. For days on end, the rains beat the dry, cracked ground. The earth became messy and muddy as I struggled with how waste and violence were connected. Grandfather sat with me an hour a day, as busy as he was. Waste is a violent action. When resources are low, people hoard. Those who are forced to do without may eventually strike out. Fighting occurs, he said. Did you want any of that when you threw away your pencil? I didn't. Is this why we spun, why we made our own cloth? Grandfather suggested I make a tree of violence, with violence as the trunk and physical violence and passive violence, the kind that looks like it hurts no one, as its branches. Before you act, think how it would affect others, he said. Who would it hurt? You? Someone else? The earth? Does hurting the earth hurt us? Together we created a tree and pasted it on the wall. Each day I added my thoughts and actions to it. As the monsoon rains renewed the earth, my tree grew and grew. Both branches were heavy with leaves, but the passive side became enormous. Grandfather would come by my hut and he'd watch my tree grow. When I wasn't sure where to place something, he helped me decide if the thought or action was passive violence or physical violence. Soon, I could see how throwing away a pencil could hurt others. More graphite needed to be mined for a new pencil. Trees would need to be cut down. Land would be stripped bare. Villages would be lost. Were my wants, like the one for a new pencil, more important than the needs of others? I saw how kicking and shoving led to rioting. I saw how violence led to more violence, how wars led to more wars. Like the soaking rains that turned the mushy earth lush and green, finally, new growth sprouted in me. I was responsible for my every thought and action. Yes, but I was also responsible for the thoughts and actions of the world. I don't know if Arun knows this, that line our editor wanted to take out. She said, I don't understand. One person isn't responsible for the world. I said, oh, oh, oh no. That's what this book is about. I said, yes, but I was also responsible for the thoughts and actions of the world. To change the world, I needed to change myself. I hope my editor learned that. That is what spirit may be asking of us, to be responsible for our own thoughts and actions and to bring about effective, lasting change. We have to begin with ourselves. When we begin, when we access our God-given talents, when we believe in ourselves, when we ask for help or assistance, and when we persist, not giving up, no matter the reaction to our efforts, Ten years of no's. We do believe things into being. We do become the change. We do heal ourselves. And we contribute to the healing of the world. Listen to spirit. Look for the light. And continue to embrace the life and love that lies ahead. The future world depends on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now I have the great pleasure. I, I enjoy when I get to speak before Gandhi because I'm always so touched that um, I get to welcome him to the stage. And he is the man who lived these stories. He is the man who, with his yes, changed my life. And I warmly welcome Dr. Arun Gandhi to the stage.
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you, Richard and Vicky, and all of you for making it possible for us to be here and to share with you a little bit of my grandfather's wisdom. I got up this morning uh, thinking about what am I going to, what part of Gandhi's uh, wisdom and philosophy am I going to share with you today? And I suddenly remembered the time I was in Memphis, Tennessee in the 90s, 1990s. And one day I received a very official looking letter from Washington, D.C., from the Interfaith Alliance, and uh, inviting me to come to Washington for a big interfaith meeting that they were organizing. And when I looked down the margin of all the people involved in this, I found there were only Jews and Christians. And so I wrote back to them and I said, uh, how can you call yourself interfaith if you only represent Jews and Christians? <laughs> I mean, there are so many other uh, religions in the US, uh, and why have you ignored all of them? So they promptly inducted me as the Hindu member. <laughs> <laughs> But that is, you know, still to many, uh, to uh, a substantial extent, that is the concept of interfaith uh, here in the United States. And I was thinking about this and, and thinking about my grandfather's ideas of interfaith. And he came to this conclusion because of his experiences with Hinduism. Uh, as a little boy, when he was growing up and he experienced uh, the hate and the prejudice that existed in the Hindu religion uh, because he was often playing with the little uh, sweeper boy uh, who came uh, to their home and his parents were sweeping the yard and, and uh, grandfather used to play with this young boy and his mother didn't like it. Uh, she made him go and have a bath every time uh, because she, he had touched the sweeper. And that, you know, when he grew up and began to reflect on this, and then he saw more deeply all the hate and the prejudice that existed in uh, Hinduism, he began to be turned off from that. And then as a young man, he went to England to study law. And there... Uh, he came in touch with many Christians, and uh, he decided to read the Bible and see what the Bible has to say. And he unfortunately first started with the Old Testament. <laughs> <laughs> and he confessed very uh, quickly that it bored him to death. <laughs> Then he took the New Testament and read that, and he was very impressed by the Sermon on the Mount, uh, and because that really uh, captured the essence of everything that he b believed in and, uh, and wanted the world to be. And uh, so he read the Bible right through and was beginning to move towards uh, maybe even converting to Christianity, till he went to South Africa uh, as a young lawyer. And one Sunday morning, he decided uh, to go to a church and attend the service there. So he just walked into the nearest church there, not realizing that there was uh, segregation and hate and prejudice even in the church. He walked into the church in the middle of the service, and when the minister saw him walking in, he stopped the service, went out there, grabbed him by the collar and threw him out, said, this is a church for white people only. You are not allowed to come in here. And that really made him uh, 
you know, opened his eyes to all the hate and prejudice that exists in all the religions of the world. And he said, how can we believe in, in God when God stands for love and acceptance and understanding? And in God's name, we hate people and, and reject people. This is contrary to everything that he believed in. And so he, uh, he decided that he was going to make a friendly study of all the scriptures that he could lay his hands on. And he said this in his writings, and it's, this is his quote. He said, a friendly study of all the scriptures is the sacred duty of every individual. And he made that friendly study, and he em emphasized the word friendly, because we do make critical studies all the time of all the different religions but we never do make a friendly study. And it's very important that we look at all the religions in a friendly way. And he made this study, and he found that none of the religions had the whole truth. That every one of them had just a little bit of the truth. And we hang on to that little bit of truth, thinking that that is everything, and we don't need to look for anything else. He used to explain this to us uh, when I was living with him. In terms of the six visually challenged people who were asked to describe an elephant by feeling the elephant. They had never seen the elephant, but uh, they were to feel the elephant and describe it. So each one of these six persons were feeling a different part of the elephant. The one who felt the legs of the elephant said, this looks, feels like a huge pole. The one who was feeling the body of the elephant said, this feels like a huge wall. The one who held the trunk of the elephant said, this feels like a huge snake. Now, each one of them had a very different perception of the elephant. They were not entirely wrong, and they were not right either. They just had that little perception. And he said that the only way they could come close to understanding what an elephant looked like was for all the six people to come together and share their uh, understanding or their experience of uh, the elephant. Then they would be able to find out what an elephant really looks like. And he said, that is what we are doing today with religion. Instead of coming together and sharing and finding out what does spirituality mean, what does God really mean, we just hang on to that little bit of truth and, uh, and, and a very distorted vision of our spirituality and, and the message of God. So we need to uh, embrace everybody, not, not in the sense of a melting pot, he didn't believe that we should all melt down and, uh, and create one religion. We must live within our religion, but we must enhance that religion, improve it, and, and make it a, a worthy religion. And that is how all of us could work together. So he evolved his prayer service every day, incorporating prayers from all the major religions of the world. And he would have the prayers outside on a nice open, uh, day, every morning and evening. Everybody knew that when Gandhi was in town, every morning there would be prayers and every evening there would be prayers. And they would just flock to the prayers. There were Hindus, Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, everybody in the congregation, because we sang all the different hymns together and um, showed equal respect to all the different religions there. And that was the key to bringing people to respect all the different religions. And now he's created a whole movement in India where a lot of people still consider, can go on in this kind of interfaith 
uh, prayer where they sing prayers from uh, the now it's come to be known as the Gandhi prayers <laughs> but that is what he emphasized in his philosophy of nonviolence. One of the aspects of his philosophy is about relationships. Relationships at the individual level, relationships at the national level, relationships in spiritual level, in all of these things. Relationship was a very important thing in his philosophy. And he always said that relationships must be built on the four principles of love, love and respect, of course, go hand in hand, respect, understanding, acceptance, and appreciation. We have to respect ourselves and respect each other and respect our connection with all of creation which is very important because a lot of us have been brought up to believe that we are independent individuals and we can do whatever we like and it's nobody's business. We are not independent individuals. We are interconnected, interrelated, and we have to respect that. And it's only when we respect that that we will understand who we are and what we are and why are we here on earth. We are not here to while away our time from birth to death. We are here to make an impact on the world, to leave the world a better place uh, than we had uh, inherited it. And so we have to understand that. And we have to, when we begin to understand that, then we will accept each other as human beings and not identify people by all the labels we have put upon ourselves. Today we have so many labels to identify people that we have forgotten that behind those labels there is a human being. We have gender labels, religious labels, uh, economic labels, you name it and we have a label. Uh, and we forgot that behind all those labels there is a human being so we have to remove all those labels we have to start looking at each other as human beings and respecting and loving each other as human beings and it's only when we are able to do that that we will appreciate our own humanity so these were the principles on which relationships were built at every level in human beings and he always talked about how that kind of relationship will ultimately lead to peace so i want to conclude today with sharing one story with you that he was very fond of telling us when we were growing up of an ancient indian king who once became very curious about the meaning of peace and he invited all the intellectuals in his kingdom to come and explain the meaning of peace. And everybody came there and did their best, but nobody could really satisfy the king. And then one day there was an intellectual from another town who came on a visit. And the king asked him the meaning of peace. And he said, the only person who can give you a satisfactory answer is an old sage who lives outside your kingdom. But he is so old that he cannot come to you. You will have to go to him and ask him this question. So the next day, the king went to the sage and asked him the meaning of peace. And the sage quietly went to the back of the house, came back with a grain of wheat, and placed that grain of wheat on the king's palm and said, here is your answer. And of course, the king didn't know what a grain of wheat had to do with peace. So he quietly clutched, clutched that grain of wheat and went back to his palace and found a little gold box. And he placed that grain in the box. And every morning he would open the box to look for an answer and he couldn't find any answer. <laughs> so a few days later, when this intellectual came back on the return visit, the king asked him to explain said, you sent me to the sage, he's given me this grain of wheat, and I don't know what the grain of wheat has to do with peace. 
And the intellectual said, it's very simple. He said, as long as you keep this grain of wheat in this box, nothing is going to happen. It will eventually rot and perish, and that will be the end of the story. But if you had allowed this grain of wheat to interact with all the elements, if you had planted this outside in the soil, it would sprout and grow, and very soon you could have a whole field of wheat. And that is the meaning of peace. That if somebody has found peace and they keep it locked up in their hearts for their own personal gains, it will perish with them. But if they let it interact with all the elements, it would sprout and grow, and very soon we could have a whole world of peacemakers. So I have come here today to give you the grain of wheat that I got from my grandfather. And I hope that you won't let it rot and perish, but let it interact so that all of us together can change this world and make it a better place for future generations. Thank you. Thank you. get to feel the blessing today as we sing a song called Blessed Always. You know, you remind us of who we are. We are also peace farmers and we can use those grains of wheat in so many creative ways. And so as we sing ourselves into this meditation, let's just bring with us these words of wisdom, this unconditional love. Blessed always, blessed always. For the arms of God surrounds us. Let our joy be so triumphant that we rest in God and say Amen. Let's sing this together again. Blessed always, blessed always, for the arms of God surround us. Let our joy be so triumphant that we rest in God and say, So we're going to take that prayer into our meditation this morning. I invite you to take a deep cleansing breath in and exhale. And as you do, just allow yourself to sink deeply into that seat. Feel yourself relaxing in your shoulders and your torso, your, all the way down your legs, to your feet. And it's in this place that you begin to know those thoughts that are running through your head now can rest. For there's a harmony that's beginning to be experienced, a comfort level moving you into your heart, reconnecting you to who you really are. This morning as we go into a time of silence, let's bring with us the words of Bethany and Dr. Gandhi. Healing anything that needs to be healed. Remembering who we truly are. Coming into a place of knowing we are truly compassionate beings, peaceful beings, loving beings. And so if we remember that our outer strength truly depends upon our inner stillness, let's go into this silence today remembering that I am a peaceful being. 
I am a being. 